So what are the benefits of telemedicine? They are vast, all right? The list is long, as you can see by this slide. It certainly improves healthcare access. It is important to note that, especially in rural and frontier areas, it benefits physicians and providers, uh, of course, in both value-based care landscape, as well as a direct primary care model. Um, it can really affect practice revenues. It can increase your revenues when you have good reimbursement. And so January 1, hopefully, we'll, have, we'll set off uh, our foot on better reimbursement in the state of Kansas. But seeing and treating more patients in the same or less time by providing some care virtually can certainly help a practice. And um, that way, your in-person appointments could be opened up for persons with more in complex needs. The ability to see and treat in the same or less time means more frequent care touches uh, for patients, which also benefits healthcare outcome and the organization's bottom line. So we're trying to help improve that healthcare access by offering telehealth and telemedicine. It certainly reduces unnecessary patient transport. Um, I, I have a 92-year-old 92 92 old father um, who you know, has to come to Wichita, so he's an hour away, and what that does is it really interrupts um, a family time because the fact that if one of us have to take him, I have to drive an hour to get there and then drive him back an hour and then an hour to take him home and drive him back home an hour. So that's at least a half a day, if not more. But it's so much nicer if when somebody is not feeling well, if we can reduce that unnecessary patient transport. Addresses the healthcare provided shortage. It really can help with the joy of practice. If we can uh, help physicians stay in their practice longer or recruit physicians because we have telemedicine and they would be able to try something different, um, it certainly helps with that care provider shortage. Reduces family stress. I think I mentioned the stress of family before. It reduces um, the provider travel time and cost to outreach sites. So if you have satellite offices and your providers are driving to and from, that windshield time can be cut out and reduced by the fact that you have telemedicine. So instead of going back to that satellite uh, site for perhaps follow-ups, um, that would be a great use of time for a provider to do those follow-ups to the outreach sites via telemedicine. Also, we're using telemedicine for continuing education like we are today. And it also helps retain patients locally in their home communities. Specialty care is available locally. If you provide uh, specialties uh, by telemedicine to your organization, that's great advertisement for your organization. It's a great advertisement for your community being progressive. And it can also serve as an economic development tool to attract new businesses and uh, whatnot to your community. So the benefits are many. But there's resistance to telemedicine still uh, in 2018, even though it's been around for over 25 years. There's st still that uncertainty about HIPAA and technology, but TA can help um, reduce that uncertainty and help you realize that the technology can be secured and encrypted and you can comply with all of the HIPAA regulations by using telemedicine. There's a lack of training. Yes, I know there is a lack of training, but we can help with that at the HTRC. There's also some perceptions that certain populations may not like telemedicine, but I can assure you that those are myths. And there's a lot of research out there that shows even older adults enjoy the telemedicine aspect. Licensing and credentialing has been a, a sore spot for some, but it can be overcome with a few simple steps and concerns about proper reimbursement have certainly been a concern in the state of Kansas, but luckily with the passage of the Kansas Telemedicine Act, we're hoping to overcome that come January 1. And of course, there have been concerns about malpractice, but those happen to be myths as well. There's maybe a handful of suits that have happened uh, concerning telemedicine, but really it was just about the standards of care. 
and it would have been probably a, a lawsuit had it not been um, for it if it had even been an in-person visit. So uh, I think some of these resistance to telemedicine is fear. Um, it's something different, something new. You know, some people just don't like change. But apparently you do because you were on this webinar. And so we're going to continue and talk about at the root of telemedicine, there are several aspects that you have to employ. When you look outside and you see this gorgeous tree, okay, you know that it has an extensive root system. That extensive root system is the same when it comes to developing a beautiful telemedicine program. You have to have that extensive root system and address every one of those prior to launching any telemedicine program. So you will have to talk about legal and malpractice. You will have to look at training your staff as well as branding and marketing. And I can tell you that there have been um, telemedicine programs fail because they didn't brand or market their program. If nobody knows you have a telemedicine program, no one's gonna use it. So it's important to work with all of these aspects in your organization, bring everyone to the table, and make sure that everyone realizes the impact that telemedicine can have on your organization. The most successful telehealth programs begin with drum roll assessment. Um, it is important to assess the organization's readiness to make sure that um, everyone's on the same page and um, to get those informal leaders involved in your organization as well, uh, to have them come to the table to make sure that they are going to promote your telemedicine program um, with positive accolades. So we get started when we do this assessment, we make sure that we increase that internal buy-in. We look at ways to unlock different revenue streams. What is it that's gonna be the best for your organization? It's silly to start out with a telemedicine program that's not going to affect the majority of your population you probably need to look at what is going to be the most helpful to your population and what actually is going to be the low hanging fruit. Which one could we start first, experience success, and then move on to the next? So build on existing telehealth programs. Perhaps you had a telehealth program. I know there's a lot of telecom uh, systems and closets throughout Kansas. I hate to say that, but it's true. Uh, some of them are dead. Okay, they really can't be resurrected, but there are, there's new technology that we can use um, a lot cheaper and uh, more consistent. And then also we have to look at developing protocol and policies to make sure everybody knows what to do when there is a telemedicine appointment. And then, as I said before, determine your needs. We'll look at equipment. We'll look at program development as well as operational support. We'll look at that insurance reimbursement as it stands now and as it will in the future. We'll look at some evaluation because that's critical. Um, continuous quality improvement is critical in a telemedicine program and we can show you how to do that as well as look at ways to market it. So getting started, that's what we would do. We'd look at protocols, we would look at guidelines and policies, that workflow, how's that going to work in your particular organization. We'll work on a detailed technology plan with your IT, um, because it's not IT's responsibility to start this, it's everyone It has a piece of the pie when we're planning for telehealth. And then we'll develop that performance monitoring plan as I discussed earlier. And also look at, hey, are your patients satisfied? Are your healthcare providers satisfied with this telehealth program? Staff buy-in and training is critical, and I recommend that you have a telemedicine committee in order for that role delineation and those quality measure reports so that you can continue to review them and continue to improve. So you establish those lines of service. You can present to the clinical team and get their buy-in. Also, um, have that hardware and software um, situated and ready to go. And um, of course, we have to have training. But the location and connectivity of telemedicine is incredibly important. So if you're going to be a distance site, meaning 
the healthcare provider in your organization is going to be the telehealth provider, you have to look at where's that going to occur? Is it going to occur in the provider's office? And hopefully it's not an office that looks like the picture in here. Um, does, is it private? Are there good acoustics? Is it comfortable for the provider? Then the originating site is where the patient is. So maybe you are going to bring specialty clinics to your organization via telemedicine. So if you're the originating site and the patient is there, it can be an exam room that's retrofitted with telemedicine equipment, but it has to be private. The acoustics have to be good. There has to be that level of comfort. Do you need peripheral devices for these specialties? Um, if you have a cardiologist, are you going to need a stethoscope that hooks to the monitor or is Bluetooth? It depends on whatever technology you choose and what, what the clinic can afford. And then also, is the room big enough that if there needs to be a family member present during uh, the appointment, are they able to sit in there comfortably? So right now, the distance site where the provider is looked like this on the left-hand side 20-some years ago. Two monitors, Dr. Doolittle, our oncologist, you know, one of the fathers of telemedicine in the state of Kansas, let's say, and in the nation, uh, used these big monitors, had big boxes. Um, it was definitely dark, and, you know, he had to go to a particular room to, to do this, and, um, Today, uh, Dr. Edison on the right-hand side, she is a dermatologist with the University of Missouri. Her setup is two monitors, which a lot of us work with two monitors now, but it's a wonderful way to do telemedicine because you can have the patient on one monitor, you can have your electronic medical record pulled up on the other monitor, and you don't skip a beat. But she does that from the comfort of her own office, and so she doesn't have to go to a certain room, she can just go to her office, and all of her equipment and um, information is right there, ready to see that patient. And she can see them one right after the other. So the originating site, the patient room, kind of looks like this. Uh, the top left picture is a great example of maybe a behavioral health uh, type appointment because there's not a lot of equipment, there's just that pan tilt zoom, that can be controlled by the um, behavioral health care provider. And uh, she's situated in front of the screen so that she can uh, be seen and looked at by that provider as well. The other ones are more clinical based. So you can see one is a cart. Well, the bottom left is a cart with the double screen as well. And they can see the provider and then what, it, what the provider is seeing on his screen as well. Um, it, that's a really nice setup. Um, but whatever works, you know, whatever your exam room and whatever works for you is what's important when you're talking about the patient side, the originating side. There are many primary care clinical use cases for telehealth. Um, I, the list is uh, obvious, and uh, a lot of these are those that clinics choose because this is what they're dealing with the most, and they feel like they can get more um, uh, patient touches with telehealth if we're working with these kind of use cases. Uh, wellness exam follow-ups are excellent for telemedicine as well to, to give those results. Um, and then the visit could also focus on health education and a focus on that lifestyle change. So all these results can easily be done by telehealth. And that way, you know, patients don't have to travel so far. I know that some of uh, your patients may have to travel a great distance even just to get to your rural health clinic. Is your infrastructure ready? That's something that we talk about too. Sufficient bandwidth is really important when it comes to televideo uh, telemedicine. That downlink and uplink uh, is important to, to note. So it's megabits per second, MBPS. So a single physician practice, you could get by with four, okay? Small, you uh, probably need about 10. Larger practices, um, 25 megabits per second, and hospitals need at least 100. Now it's a really good idea not to have a lot of telemedicine programs if you have 
um, if you don't have a lot of bandwidth, but don't do telemedicine at the same time. Your billing office is uploading data or downloading data from the night before. Uh, you don't want to tax that bandwidth because then you do get that choppy type of um, picture, which is not you know good quality. You want your telemedicine programs or your appointments to be of good quality. So it's really important. But it's also noted that there are organizations that can do televideo with 1.5 um, megabits per second. It just depends on what's going on. And some communities experience, you know, like a, um, a slog, let's say, of internet, maybe when the kids are out of school and they all get on their gaming things and they're doing that. Um, that really taxes a community's bandwidth. And some of our communities are still struggling with that. So. Um, it's important to understand maybe telemedicine shouldn't be done um, after school. The most reliable is when you're hardwired to the modem. Um, relying on Wi-Fi with telemedicine kind of creates those differences in speed, image, and quality. So it's important um, to be able to make sure that that quality is um, excellent and that your patients are satisfied with that. So equipment, I, I can't stress enough that you really don't have to purchase a ton of equipment to start telemedicine. You don't have to purchase the most expensive equipment to start telemedicine as well. Um, higher resolution cameras improve the quality of images and requires more pixels, but that also requires more bandwidth. So you really have to look at that in terms of whether or not your um, organization can support that. But the goal is really to make technology disappear, to have that patient forget that they're seeing a telemedicine visit. As you can see in this middle picture, this is a picture of the ALS clinic that Dr. Barron from KU Med started in Wichita. So Dr. Barron on the right hand side, you can see Dr. we call him Virtual Barron, is just a cart with a tablet established and we put the little coat and the you know stethoscope around it to make it look even more doctorish if you will and um, so he sees these ALS patients in Wichita after the ALS patients go through a series of um, ancillary services so their appointment when they make their appointment instead of having to drive three hours to Kansas City see Dr. Barron drive three hours back then spend different mornings or afternoons going to a speech pathologist, um, a dietitian, an equipment specialist. Um, the, the list is made, there's like six specialists that are in the queue for someone with ALS, all right? Physical therapy being one of them. Instead of going to all those different appointments and instead of driving to and from Kansas City, people in the South Central areas of Kansas can come to Wichita, see all of their ancillary services that morning and then Dr. Barron afterwards. So instead of scheduling days of appointments, they schedule a three hour block about once a quarter or however often Dr. Barron wants to see them. And then he appears at the end of all the rounds by televideo with all of the ancillary services sitting behind the patient, listening to Dr. Barron, asking questions of this ancillary service or that one. Hey, you know, the dietitian, did you talk about diet needs this time? The speech pathologist, did you talk about speech, you know, what is it that you're seeing? So that Dr. Barron can be in real time, up to date with what's going on, and that patient can sit there. He actually forgot that he was visiting with Dr. Barron on televideo. And um, he was so emotional after the appointment because he says, I can't believe this, you know, works for me and that all these people are here for me. And um, it was, there went a dry eye in the room um, after this little appointment. Um, but you can see that it doesn't take a whole lot of equipment to start a telemedicine program. And you certainly can stay in budget and make a huge difference to your patients. Here are some uh, peripherals. 
There's an electronic stethoscope, an exam cam. There's even wireless video otoscopes. And then on the right at the top, there's some at-home devices. And there is a prediction that many of our homes will be outfitted with these at-home devices in the very near future so that um, you can look into um, down the throat of a child in the middle of the night and beam that, you know, to that specialist. So if they're, if they're instead of having that ER visit, which, you know, we all dreaded when we had little ones and, and they were sick. So there's a lot of equipment out there. There's a lot of new equipment um, and comes out all the time. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit at the very end about how you might be able to experience this equipment and look at it um, during a telehealth showcase. So the National Technology Assessment Resource Center is one of those national TRCs that I talked about earlier. And on their website at telehealthtechnology.org, they have vetted some of this equipment for you. So you can go look at some stethoscopes and say, oh, I heard the Littman was good. So let's look at the Littman. Or I heard this one, you know, lab one was good. So you can take a look at that. And they have vetted that equipment um, and are vendor agnostic. They will tell you, oh, this worked well. This, this worked with this program. It's, it's really fascinating. So I encourage you to look at that. Um, web page. This is what I was talking about. Save the date. Telehealth Technology Summit 2018 will be in New Orleans um, December 12th and 13th. This is an opportunity for people to come to a summit and not just sit in chairs the whole time, but to go and experience some of this technology. Play with that Littman telescope. Look at, look at some of these at-home type devices that we may see in the very near future in all homes. Um, play with that exam cam that could also be used uh, as a dental cam. I mean, there's just a, a wide variety of technology out there that we want to help you experience. So if you're really in the market for some equipment, don't know really what to choose, I say Come to this telehealth technology. It's uh, very inexpensive um, in New Orleans in December. Do some holiday shopping, whatever. Um, but really, would love to see you there. Interoperability. That's a huge word. Uh, and it's certainly something that if you do have an EMR that is, has that capability, that's great. We do know that's expensive, especially for our rural partners. So if it's something that you can't add to your EMR, there are ways around that. We can work with you and hook you up with technology that you can use. You're still going to have to put it in your EMR, no matter what. Um, but if it's not interoperable at that point, we can help you do that. But we do know that that you know, is expensive. We're hoping that that expense goes down in the near future as well. Security encryption, I think I addressed a little bit of that, but um, same privacy rules apply to as the in-person encounters. We have to have equipment that uh, the data is secure and uh, through use of encryption. And then also if you're looking at platforms to make sure that you get a business associate agreement. We can't do telemedicine by Skype, okay? There's, well, if, if you use, not, not the Skype that's on your phone, all right? Skype, they say, has a health uh, platform now, and that's great, as long as they give you a business associate agreement, which is something you keep in your file that says during an audit, if you're ever audited, that yes, these um, appointments are secure and encrypted, and we can get, if, even if they pick out an appointment that happened September 4th, 2018 at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then they can go back in their records and show that it was secure and encrypted. That's what that BAA is for. There are some companies that say they can't provide you with one. Then don't use them, okay? We want you to use a platform that you won't have any problem with if you're ever audited. 
training. I mentioned training earlier. Yes, you have to be trained. Um, it doesn't take much, but it's kind of like we have to talk about telehealth and telemedicine like a newscaster, you know? You don't want your newscaster fiddling with their hair or having flashy earrings or, you know, outrageous colors on, that type of thing. They have to be mindful of that. We have to be mindful of that in telemedicine as well. So there's a lot of training on what kind of you should, how you should dress, um, what some of that etiquette is in terms of the room, uh, the preparation, of course. And some of it is, you think, common sense. But you know, when you're starting something like this, it's just best to have a checklist. We have such a checklist that we can certainly help you out with. And we talk about preparation, okay? Check that equipment 15 minutes before that appointment even occurs. Make sure the connection is good. Hey, if it's not good, if the internet's down, what are you going to do? Do you have the number for IT handy in your checklist so that you can call and say, hey, what's up? Is this gonna last all day? So you have to have these kinds of preparations in order for the quality of your appointment to be excellent. So initiating that call, you close the door to the room, always introduce yourself and the facility. It's always nice to have um, maybe in the background a logo of your facility so that whoever's on the other end knows that this is you know, what they said it was going to be that we are connecting with Salina Regional or whatever um, that organization happens to be. Um, sometimes it's not convenient to put yourself on mute when you're not speaking. Um, that's hard to remember, but if there is like a lot of activity outside, there's something going on, you know, a lot of voices, lot, it, sometimes it's better to put yourself on mute. And always introduce everyone in the room because there may be parents, um, there may be uh, children in the room that um, need to be there in order for that appointment to be a good quality appointment. So after you do all of this organizational assessment and you are, you've got your checklist down, you've got your protocols, you have your equipment selected, um, all of this, that's when you implement. I know it's really exciting because you think, oh, we're gonna do telemedicine and the fun part is implementation. The hard part is going through all of the checklists and making sure that we've covered all the bases. And the other thing is, is to practice. I cannot emphasize practicing enough. So practice on each other, okay? And say, hey, I want to connect. Let's see if this works. You know, what does this look like? What does the room look like? And practice, practice, practice before you do your first telemedicine visit so that um, pa the patient understands that it's a quality visit. So maybe uh, you're looking at telemedicine as something that you'd like to try. Um, I would like to just show you this little video of Ellsworth County Medical Center. This is part of their marketing piece, but what they've chosen to do is just provide some specialists that their patients actually see. And so instead of driving, they're bringing the specialist to Ellsworth County Medical Center and advertising it on their own cable channel. So let me start this no and let's hope it works. Ellsworth County Medical Center's new telemedicine exam room makes seeing your specialist quick and convenient. Their latest technology enables a specialist in Hayes, Salina, Hutchison, Kansas City, or other locations to chat with and examine the patient locally. And radiology and laboratory results are easily available to your doctor. Ask your specialist, can I have my visit via telemedicine? Ellsworth County Medical Center, leave the connection to us. All right, I hope that you could hear that, but that's their little branding of their telemedicine program. And um, they're, they're experiencing really nice dividends to that. Um, and sometimes it's not so much that they're making a lot of money off of it, but they know that it's the right thing to do for their community. So hopefully now we can talk about making a little money uh, when we're talking about telemedicine, because there are some telemedicine programs that are not making a lot of money because the reimbursement is really not there. But 
we can look forward to the Kansas Telemedicine Act, effective January 1 of 2019. So here are some of those um, definitions that we can see that the healthcare provider in Kansas for it to be reimbursed, um, it has to be a physician, a PA, an advanced practice nurse, or a person licensed, registered, or certified in behavioral health. Um, and also that um, there's going to be some speech and language pathology uh, reimbursement too, I have on another slide. But these are some of the definitions that came out of that act. So no, dietitians are not be, going to be reimbursed by this telemedicine act, at least through Kansas Medicaid and at least through private pay. They can be if private pay decides to, okay? But these are the ones that the telemedicine act says that will be reimbursed. So the definition, of course, is just like it is everywhere. It's where the patient is at the originating site, the provider's at the distant site, that it's real time, two-way, live, interactive, audio, visual, um, and it does not include communication between healthcare providers via telephone, voice only conversation, email, or fax. It does not include communication between a physician and a patient consisting of an email or a fax. So that's not there yet. Some of the, um, you know, the established privacy, that same privacy and confidentiality as required by HIPAA, the tel telemedicine may be used to establish a valid provider-patient relationship, so that's good. Um, it does require the same standards of practice, of course, and allows telemedicine services to a patient on follow-up care and that the telemedicine encounter must be reported to the primary care or other treating physician within three business days of the encounter. BSRB providers not required to comply with that reporting requirement. So what we know is that the application to policies, um, that individual or group health insurance policies, medical service plans, contracts, hospital service corporation contracts, hospital and medical service corporation contract, fraternal benefit society, the HMOs, and Kansas um, medical assistance program. They may not exclude an otherwise covered healthcare service from coverage solely because such service is provided through telemedicine. All right, so if they offer a certain type, if they offer a follow-up to reimburse for follow-up in person, then they are required to offer that same via telemedicine. Now, this is a coverage parity act, all right? At this point, and we don't know what the reimbursement's gonna be because they're working on that. And there's a little, what I call glitch in that because they're not required to get that done until the reimbursement part of it until December 31st and the act goes into effect January 1. Usually you have some time to look at that, what that reimbursement is going to be. So January is going to be a little crazy, I think, in terms of us learning more about what all that reimbursement is going to be. We will have a follow-up webinar to specifically address reimbursement, just so you know. Um, and hopefully we can get our hands on that in January so that we can update you all then. So you, you can see um, someone, so you can see somebody by telemedicine and be reimbursed for it as long as that service was an in-person service to begin with as well. All right. Um, I think I talked about this. This is just that language that's in um, the act, and of course you will get slides and you'll be able to read this as well. Um, the bill does not mandate coverage for a healthcare service delivered via telemedicine. If such service is not already covered, that's what I was trying to explain. Um, so it's really important that once we get to the end of 2018 and begin this telemedicine act in 2019, that we actually provide you the information that they're working on right now. This is just kind of the outline, let's say, of the act, and then it'll be up to the payers 
to work out exactly what they're going to reimburse. So rules and regulations for the behavioral, uh, the Board of Healing Arts, as well as the BSRB. Um, they're to report by December 31st, just as BSRB are to report by uh, and adopt those rules by December 31st so that everybody's in compliance. There is, uh, this was what was very controversial about this regulation. We didn't know that if it was going to pass or not because there was um, some back and forth on, of course, this language. But providers may not authorize um, the abortion medication uh, via telemedicine. And if the court ever rules that the abortion language is invalid or unconstitutional, then the entire act is going to be void. So that was put in there um, by the Kansans for Life that were uh, doing that kind of, um, uh, what do I want to say, lobbying. And so that's in there. It's just important for you to know that that is there. It's not uncommon. It's there, other states have this language too. So um, we're not unique, let's just say, in this. And other states have had that um, kind of uh, back and forth as well. Here's the speech language pathology and audiology. So this, this snuck in at the, at the last minute, really. And um, so KDHE or Medicaid will be required to cover speech language pathology services and audiology services by telehealth. So that's good news um, because I think that that will assist a lot of our rural health partners. Um, and so then KDG will be required to do a report of how that works um, in 2020. So that's in that language. So I know that that's um, actually, that's not a lot that I can share about the Kansas Telemedicine Act because that's it. Um, there's just an outline that says who can practice and who can be reimbursed for telemedicine when that reimbursement schedule is due, at, which is December 31st, and then it starts January 1, it kind of lists what you can't do by telemedicine. And otherwise, it's kind of wide open because the originating sites, you'll still have to abide by the same originating sites as Medicare if you're seeing somebody from Medicare. But I think what has happened with this Kansas Telemedicine Act is that it has opened up like for schools to be an originating site. So we could have school-based clinics. We could have kiddos, you know, go to the nurse's office and be seen by telehealth by a provider instead of those kiddos having to miss a whole day of school because they have to travel to a specialist, let's say, especially for a follow-up visit when maybe that follow-up visit is like 15 minutes long. So the lessons learned with telemedicine and um, working with that, it's still medicine. Technology is just the tool. It's not real. It's not different medicine. So that's what we have to get across. Telemedicine is it's a tool that we can still use with the same standards of care to promote better health and access to care for people that may not have that ability to travel or to see a specialist. It's important to plan for telehealth. You cannot over plan for telehealth. Um, the best telehealth programs are the ones that they spend the time in that root system that I talked about with that tree. Um, spend some time there, get, get some, you know, particulars down and plan, plan, plan for telehealth. Another thing is to start with one service line. Do it well. I mean, absolutely get it down and then add on to another. You cannot be all and be everything to everyone in the very beginning. So it's important just kind of get your feet wet and make sure that you are establishing that service line and doing it well. And then the other is to practice, 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 practice makes perfect. And so it's very important that you practice that telemedicine as you um, move along and before you implement. For more webinars on telehealth, you also have the opportunity on the third Thursday of every month to connect to the National Consortium of TRC, so our national partners, 
and each TRC usually takes their turn and does, you know, um, a, a webinar for this year-long series as well. The next one is September 20th, and it's going to talk about behavioral assessment for children with autism and related disorders. That's by our Northwest Telehealth Research, uh, Resource Center partners. So I encourage you to look at that. Um, you can um, certainly, if you are on our telehealth newsletter um, mailing list, you'll get notices of these, but if not, then certainly uh, let me know and I will give you that information as well. Again, the HTRC webinar series, this, welcome to the first one. Thank you for being the inaugural participants, but it will occur the first Tuesday of every month. And next month, uh, we'll have Carla Deckert talking about how Project ECHO is changing the world fast, especially in Kansas. And hopefully some of you are um, participating in Project ECHO. And so if you have questions, we do have time for a few questions, and I'm happy to do that. Here is my contact information. Um, you may certainly um, ask me questions by email as well. And make sure you go to our website and uh, um, uh, just explore that. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit of information on there, some videos, some how-tos, some documents, that type of thing. So please feel free to explore that as well. Any questions? Janine, there is a question in the chat box. Great. Um, could you please clarify, clarify between the private insurance and Medicaid reimbursement with the Kansas Telemedicine Act again? Okay. So the, Cal the Telemedicine Act in Kansas is going to clarify for us by December 31st what Medicaid, what our Kansas Medicaid will pay and what will be in reimbursement, how much, okay? Um, and then private payers have to kind of come up with their schedule too. Medicare is on, it, it's still its own, all right? We have to abide by Medicare's rules. Um, they have their own and actually most of telehealth was, has been established by Medicaid's throughout other states and private payers by looking at Medicare standards. But we do know that Medicare needs to expand or broaden their reimbursement buckets. So the Kansas Telemedicine Act will have effect on our Medicaid, Kansas Medicaid. I don't know what that's gonna be yet in terms of reimbursement. I do know they have to reimburse, okay, for those services that they cover for in-person. We don't know the amount yet, and that's what we're waiting for. The same goes with private pay. So if there's a private payer in the state of Kansas as of January 1, 2019, if they provide you know, services for their patients by in-person and they reimburse those services for in-person, then they have to cover them by telemedicine as well. So that's what that act says. It's a coverage parity act. Some states have reimbursement parity act that says if we reimburse $150 for this visit, that means we'll reimburse that same amount for telemedicine. We're not seeing that in this, we could. I mean, hopefully they'll do that without having to be told to, but I think that there are gonna be some differences in the amount of reimbursement that we'll get. Remains to be seen, so stay tuned. Any other questions? All right. Janine, I didn't see anything pop up. Okay, that's great. Well, stay tuned. Put, put this on your calendar that we'll be exploring this as we go, as we move along throughout the year. If you have questions specifically, please email me or give me a call. I'm happy to answer those questions. If you would like some free technical assistance for a telemedicine program in your organization, please contact me and I'd be happy to help. Thank you so much, Janine, and thank you to the participants, and we'll see you again uh, next month. Bye-bye.